I know it's not the best way to start a video, but I promise to explain why later. Anyways, do any of you remember when Street Fighter 2 was THE game to play? Do you also remember how practically no one had ever heard of the original Street Fighter? The MechWarrior series started out pretty much the same way. The second game was hugely popular, but barely anyone had ever heard of the first one, let alone seen it. So it's time to dig through my archives and unearth an ancient DOS game few people remember, the original MechWarrior which, quite honestly, hasn't aged well. It was impressive when it was new, but it's long since lost its luster. Before we get into all the technical details though, let's take a look at the game stats. MechWarrior was developed by Dynamics and published by Activision in 1989. It's a one-player first-person action simulation game featuring support for multiple 320x200 graphics modes and support for multiple sound cards. I recommend the EGA 16 color graphics mode, and as for sound, the AdLib support is probably your best bet. As for its release date, well, I just don't have a clue. I mean, nowhere on the internet can I find a statement of the game being made free or anything, but at the same time, fully legitimate places like Moby Games and the Battletech Wiki have download links for this game. That's just weird. In any case, if you want an actual physical copy of the game, your best bet is to scour the net for something called Power Hits Battletech, which actually includes three Battletech games, including the original MechWarrior, and it's a lot easier to find than just this game on its own. It's not cheap though, and while some sellers try to charge outrageous amounts for it, you shouldn't have to pay more than about $20 or $30 for it. Now, because this is an older game based on the Battletech gaming system envisioned by the company FASA, there's a lot of focus on the story. You play the role of Gideon Braver Vandenberg, the son of Duke Cameron Vandenberg of Anders Moon, a world under control of the Federated Sons in Davian Space. A little over a month before his 18th birthday in the year 3024, Gideon's family castle is attacked while he's absent. All of his family is killed in the process, and a special artifact known as the Chalice of Herne is stolen. And this chalice is extremely important because it's used in the ritual which determines the next duke to rule the world. Now, although there's no direct proof at first, it's pretty certain in Gideon's mind that this feat was accomplished by the rival McBryn family in order for its current leader, Jairus McBryn, to seize the dukedom for himself. However, things didn't quite go according to plan for Jairus. The Council of Representatives decided that because Gideon survived, and because he had not yet reached the age of adulthood, which is 23, that the selection of a new duke would be postponed until then. Jairus isn't willing to wait though, and he's somehow able to drudge up false accusations of conspiracy against Gideon, who decides the best course of action is to flee Anders Moon for the time being, and put together a new mercenary unit called the Blazing Aces. By building up wealth and manpower, Gideon figures he'll be able to find both the chalice and the evidence he needs to take his rightful place as the next leader of Anders Moon. The only catch is that he only has five years to make it happen, otherwise Jairus will almost certainly be elected Duke instead. One thing that's kind of odd about this game is that the story and gameplay barely mesh together at all, and it's almost like two completely different games are competing with each other, a choose-your-own-adventure style novel and a 3D first-person battle engine. In fact, you can get through almost the entire story without engaging in a single battle, and this is actually the best thing to do, because if you sell the Jenner mech you start with, the travel cost between planets becomes very cheap, and then when you actually get close to the end of the story, you get a big influx of cash and can arm yourself with one of the best mechs available, then just immediately go for mercenary contracts to pay more than a bare minimum. The on-screen system you have for interacting with the game is actually pretty simple. You have six icons you can choose between. The top left icon shows you your career status, lets you assign and dismiss crew members, or look through news articles and personal messages. The icon in the top right lets you travel between a large number of planets in the inner sphere, provided you have the money. The left middle icon lets you review, repair, buy, sell, and reload any of your mechs. The right middle icon brings you to a bar, where you can either advance the story in some cases by ordering a drink, or hire people to join your mercenary group. The bottom left icon, when available, lets you take on contracts for the successor state which controls the area of space you're in. Usually to get the most money possible, you'll want to take on missions for the Federated Sons and Davian space, as the other successor states each have their own annoying idiosyncrasies when it comes to mercenary contracts. Lastly, the bottom right icon brings up the options menu and allows you to save and load your game. Now let's get some action going while I talk about the battle mechs. MechWarrior features eight mechs you can pilot. The Locust, the Jenner, the Phoenix Hawk, the Shadow Hawk, the Rifleman, the Warhammer, the Marauder, and the Battlemaster. However, some of you may have already clued in that a lot of these mechs don't appear in later MechWarrior games. This is because almost all of these mechs, except for the Jenner, are considered unseen and that their likeness is actually based on trademark designs owned by other companies. 
In doing research for this review, I found it disappointing just how many of the original FASA mech designs are so incredibly similar to designs featured in other mecha-based franchises, with the differences coming down only to color variations and minor details. And I can see now why so many legal disputes have arisen over these designs. Like, speaking as a game designer, if someone made their own game using my materials and sold it for profit to people, well, to put it mildly, I'd be pretty upset. For those of you who want to see for yourself, I should now present a list of each battle mech and the mech it was copied from. I was going to do this with pictures originally, but I kind of want to avoid having large trademark infringing pictures in these videos, which is actually why I centered the Warhammer on the title screen. First, from the anime series Taiyo no Kiba Dugram, we have the HT-128 Bigfoot Combat Armor, which the Battlemaster was copied from, and the original Dugram Combat Armor, which the Shadowhawk takes after. From the Crusher Joe series, all we have is the Ostal Mecha, which the Locust takes after. The last four are all from Macross, and include the VF-1 Valkyrie Variable Fighter, which the Phoenix Hawk is based on, the MBR-04 Mark VI Tomahawk Destroid, which the Warhammer takes after, the MBR-04 Mark X Defender Destroid, which the Rifleman takes after, and the Zentradi Officer's Battle Pod, which is what the Marauder is copied off of, much to my extreme disappointment. You see, the Marauder's always been my favorite battle mech, so finding out it's copied off of something else... Eh, what are you gonna do? Disappointing trademark infringements aside, the gameplay is very much simulation based. You have a huge number of controls while in the cockpit of your mech, allowing you to torso twist, engage jump jets, command your teammates, zoom your view, select weapons, even change the color of your heads up display. Curiously, instead of actually looking up and down, you simply control the up down position of your aiming reticle. This takes a lot of getting used to, but once you are used to it, you may find it actually somewhat helpful considering the way the weapons are designed. You see, each weapon in the game is either energy based or ammunition based and has a range of either short, medium, or long. Ammo based weapons generate very little heat but need to be stocked with ammo, while energy weapons generate tons of heat but can be fired limitlessly. The range indicators light up in various ways, with red indicating that you're in range at all, yellow to indicate optimal range, and blue to indicate being below minimum range, which prevents the weapon from being aimed properly. When you fire a weapon, your weapon selection will automatically switch to the next weapon in the sequence which is ready to fire, though you can toggle the AW US automatic weapon selection feature on and off with a W key, and can also toggle each individual weapon to be automatically selectable or not by using the O key while those weapons are selected. The middle MFD in your cockpit serves three purposes. By default, it shows a topographical map which can be slightly helpful in planning your strategy, but I find the FLR forward-looking radar feature much easier to handle, not to mention it has an extremely long range compared to the topographical map. On the right side of that display is your present heat levels. The more heat you build up, the slower your maximum speed gets. Although movement will reduce the rate at which your heat dissipates, the main sources of heat are going to be your weapons. If you fire too many weapons in one burst, you'll likely overheat your mech, forcing a reactor shutdown until the heat levels return to normal. While your reactor is offline, you can't move, you can't fire, you can't aim, and you are essentially a sitting target. That said, even with the game running pretty slow, the battles can go by very fast. Time is not on your side, and every second counts, as does every part of your mech. During battle, you can press D to see detailed damage information and armor penetration levels. So long as your life support engines, gyros, and leg actuators stay intact, you'll be able to battle. If your engine, gyros, or either leg actuator goes offline, you'll effectively be immobilized for the remainder of the battle, in which case you'll have to hope your lance mates can finish the job. However, if your head gets blown off or you completely lose life support, you won't just be immobilized, you'll be kind of dead, and thus forced to either reload or restart the game. One screen you might spend some time on during battle is your command screen, accessed with the C key. This screen shows you an overview of the battlefield, including the positions of known targets and allies. You can then send commands to your allies or get detailed information about their damage and weapon states. Commands can include moving to and defending certain positions, attacking specific enemies, or you can instruct your allies to act on their own accord, in which case they'll either follow you, attack the enemy, or defend something that needs defending. You know, I'm actually already starting to run out of stuff to talk about, because the depth of this game isn't displayed very well. Much of the depth of what you can do and what can happen is spontaneous and happens when you don't expect it. Such as one particular mission I played where the Capellan Confederation refused to pay me my earnings for my contract because I supposedly breached it somehow. I think the best thing I can do at this point is give some tips to those of you who want to try this game out. First of all, you can negotiate your contracts to far greater extents than you might expect. When you find a contract you want to take on, move the cursor to the payment numbers and jack them up considerably, at least four or five times what they are. When you submit the changes, you'll be sent revised numbers which you can then further negotiate. Once you feel the numbers won't go any higher, just put a couple or three more notches onto them and submit and they should be accepted. 
in all the time I spent playing the game for this review, my adjustments were only ever flat out rejected once. Though it was a bit of a nuisance, since if that happens, you'll have to go take a trip to somewhere else to start getting contracts again. Secondly, the fastest and most profitable way to take out a mech in battle is to either cripple one of the legs or blow off the head. Shooting the head off will always result in the best salvage possible, and the head of each mech is usually the least armored. But it's also the most difficult spot to hit, and requires extreme precision. Your better option if you're not a master at aiming in this game is to go for the legs. Usually you want to aim around where the legs meet the torso, as this is the most vulnerable spot in the legs, and a good solid hit there can cripple a leg actuator and be just as effective as a headshot. The only catch is that unlike the head, the legs are the second most armored parts of any mech, followed only by the center torso, meaning that without a critical hit, it takes a ton of damage to cripple one. That said, if you can't actually get around behind a mech, rear armor is frequently worse than head armor, and a number of shots in the back, while not good for salvage, will take down a mech both quickly and easily. Another useful tip is to always sell your mechs in out-of-the-way places, like the planet Land's End in the Dacronus Combine. Capital planets like Tharkid in the Lyran Commonwealth are a good place to buy mechs because the prices there are so much lower than normal. Good places to buy are also good places to repair, which makes such places good for taking on contracts as well. You should be careful about the contract you take too. Make sure you're not crossing half the inner sphere in the process or else a lot of time is going to pass between your missions, which will cut into your 5 year time limit to win the main story, after which you can actually keep playing the game if you really want to, though to beat the final 2 part mission, you've got to pretty much have all battle masters and really good pilots in control of them. But it's not a crime to skip the main storyline, and you can play for as long afterwards as you want. However, unless you win the main story, make sure you never go back to Anders Moon. Otherwise, you'll be sent to prison and unceremoniously assassinated during a prison riot. Fun, huh? So that's pretty much all I have to say about MechWarrior. This is a good start to the series, but badly aged and not really worth playing more than once. DOSBox settings this time around also have a couple of quirks. Firstly, you need to set a fixed cycles count, but keep in mind that the speed of the game will vary considerably during your missions, and there's no way around it. So choose a cycle setting that goes as fast as you feel comfortable with, so that when large battles happen, the game doesn't go too slow. I'm using a cycle setting of 4000. One curious thing you have to do is go into the MIDI section of the configuration file and change the MPU401 setting to UART mode. If you don't do this, the game has a tendency to lock up when you complete a mission. It's also a good idea to manually set your graphics and sound modes from the DOS prompt or the autoexec section. To run with EGA graphics and adlib support, use the command line MW space 1 space A. As for the graphics scalers, they really enhance the 2D aspects between missions, but don't really help at all during the missions themselves when everything goes 3D. So you're just going to have to try it both ways and see what you like the best. And that's all for this episode of Ancient DOS Games. Stay tuned for episode 33, where we're actually going to cover the next similar game made by the same developer. If you know what game that is, then send your guests to ADG at Pixelships.com and be prepared to see some curious similarities next Saturday.